Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums... Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hello, 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 and welcome back to Rossafari Zoo News, your look at everything going on in the world of zoos and aquariums and conservation organizations and all kinds of animal weirdness. I am uh, excited to be bringing you this episode from Florida, where I've mentioned that I'm, I'm doing a quick run of Million Dollar Quartet at the Barbara B. Mann, which is a performing arts venue in uh, Fort Myers, Florida. So yeah, I'm, I'm down here and I'm having a really good time. The show is sold well. Audiences are digging it. The cast is rocking as as we do. Uh, and it's it's just been a really great experience. I'm also here doing some really, really cool interviews that y'all are gonna get to hear in a couple months. I am I'm so excited for some of the things that uh have been have been coming Rossafari's way lately. So I'm I'm excited to to get to that uh stuff with you all. But um before we do, we have to talk about what's going on with the the news of zoos this week. Week, right? So um, I'm cheating a little bit this week for the record. In fact, um, in order to make this episode happen and happen on time, I'm recording it really early. I'm starting this on Saturday, March 18th. So the day after I drop the Zoo News, I'm, I'm starting recording this. Now, it is my intention to uh, record some stuff here and then keep up throughout the week and add some stuff and, and you know, all those good things. But I can't really promise that I will be doing that. And here is why. I want to be transparent with y'all. So, um... It is currently Saturday, like I said, and we had rehearsal today, and um, uh, we are free this evening. And then tomorrow is Sunday, and um, that starts tech. And if you don't know how theater works, tech is when you're there basically all day doing the thing. And uh, we have tech on Sunday. We have tech on Monday. We have half a day of tech on Tuesday, and then we open Tuesday night. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I am going to be going to facilities. I'll be doing some podcast recording and all that good stuff during the day. And then I'll be doing shows each night. And then Saturday and Sunday are two show days each, but that doesn't even matter for Zoo News because it will already be past the day that, that Zoo News comes out. So yeah, let me say right at the start that if I uh, I miss a story that you you sent me, or even if I forget to say your name at the end of this episode, it might just be that I wasn't able to go back and edit in all of those things in time, and I promise I'll make it up to you the next week. Uh, but for now, it seemed more important to get stuff done, especially because actually I've already had a bunch of stories sent to me for this week already, as well as a few from last week that I couldn't get to. So that is my official caveat for what is going on for this week. And um, frankly, I like to think that that was enriching for you somehow. I don't know. I'm a goober. Anyway, Rasafari Zoo News. This is a crowdsourced uh, news program. If you would like to hear your name in the end credits, then you can just send me Zoo News stories. You can do so by sending them to rasafaripod at gmail.com. Or you can um, go ahead and uh, tag me in them on social media, at Rasafari on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and at Rasafari Pod on TikTok. All right, I've said enough. Let's get to this. One, two, three, four. Ow, oh, there's a funky monkey. Treat kangaroo. Or a binge around. It's Zoo News. Yeah. All right, y'all. So it is official. The uh, 10 best today from USA Today has been released for a bunch of different categories uh, that involve zoos. And so we're going to start off by talking through those results. Now, if you are a longtime fan of the pod, then you know that I have 
criticized this list before um, and, and kind of even said it's not important. You may even be wondering why I'm spending time on it. Well, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, um, this is a thing where people can go and vote for the top facilities. So most people have only been to a few zoos. Most people are going and voting for their own zoos. And, you know, it's all about whoever can get the most people to vote. I know I mentioned on here before that um, the Cincinnati Zoo member page on Facebook in particular has somebody who who pushes every day reminding people to vote. And he's, he's very kind about it. I shouldn't say push. I'm just saying that every day he's p- putting up posts and reminding people and encouraging it and posting the link and all that stuff. Um, and, and, you know, so there's a lot of excitement from that group of people, whereas the San Diego Zoo, uh, I think they might have mentioned it on their social media once or not at all. And so you end up with this list of zoos like the San Diego Zoo just not appearing on the 10 best zoos in the country. And we all know that's total bullcrap. So that part of it is a little wonky to me, but it is worth mentioning that, you know, these results show up in search engines and and the zoos that do win do do make a big deal about it sometimes and and also Frankly, one of the things that I think is really important about this is that this year, unlike other years that I have seen, a lot of zoos and aquariums really, really pushed voting. I was shocked to see it, honestly. Um, And I guess that means that it does matter, at least to those facilities. So without further ado, we're going to talk about some of those results. And I'm going to start with one. I'm not going to do the whole list, but uh, there is a top 10 botanical gardens list. And this does apply to a few zoos out there as well. So at number 10 is the Living Desert Zoo and Gardens in Palm Desert, California, which is obviously a zoo as well as a botanical garden. And I really, really do love it there. It's it's awesome to see them getting some recognition. And then at number two for botanical gardens is the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden in Cincinnati, Ohio. So uh, yeah, two zoos making the top 10 list for botanical gardens is pretty cool. Next on the list is the top 10 safari parks in the U.S. Number 10 is the Global Wildlife Center in Folsom, Louisiana. Number 9 is Natural Bridge Wildlife Ranch in San Antonio, Texas. Number 8 is Lion Country Safari in Loxahatchee, Florida, which is right outside of the uh, Palm Beach area. Number seven is the Colorado Wolf and Wildlife Center in Divide, Colorado. Number six is the B. Bryan Preserve in Point Arena, California. Number five is Safari West in Santa Rosa, California. Number four is The Wilds, which is uh, associated with the Columbus Zoo and is located in Cumberland, Ohio. Always love my time at The Wilds. Number three, and winner of my favorite name of all of these, is Barizona Wildlife Park in Williams, Arizona. Number two is a good friend of the pod, Fossil Rim Wildlife Center in Glen Rose, Texas. And number one is the Lee G. Simmons Wildlife Safari Park in Ashland, Nebraska. Now, one of the categories that I find the most fascinating is the Best Zoo Exhibit Award. So let's let's look at this. Number 10, the California Trail at Friend of the Pod Oakland Zoo in Oakland, California. Number nine is River's Edge at the St. Louis Zoo. Number eight is the Boyd Family Asian Trek at Zoo Knoxville in Knoxville, Tennessee. Another great, great friend of the podcast. Number seven, and we did a whole episode that had a big portion featured on this. Number seven is the kayaking tour at Brevard Zoo in Melbourne, Florida. Kayaking through that zoo is incredible, y'all. Number six. 
Oklahoma Trails at the Oklahoma City Zoo in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I just said the word Oklahoma so many times, I feel like I'm about to go into the musical. Uh, yeah, I really, really love that exhibit. And it's it's so funny. The photo that is used on the USA Today article is a um, mountain lion from Oklahoma City Zoo. And the second that I saw that picture, it took me right back because the mountain lions were absolutely the stars of that zoo for me, other than the whole red panda situation, of course, you know. What can I say? I'm a little biased. Number five, and another friend of the pod, where I just was, Land of the Tiger at Jacksonville Zoo and Gardens in Jacksonville, Florida. Love it there. Number four is the David A. Straz Jr. Manatee Critical Care Center in Tampa, Florida at Zoo Tampa at Lowry Park. Number three is Night Hunters, which is the nocturnal house at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden, another great friend of the pod. Number two is the Rocky Mountain Wild at Cheyenne Mountain Zoo in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I cannot wait to get to this zoo. It has been far too long. We've we've had them on the pod. I've communicated with them about some zoo news stories. I, I love this facility and I cannot wait to get there. And number one, remember I told you that some zoos were really pushing. Well, one of them that was, was Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo. And the number one zoo exhibit this year is Asian Highlands at Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha, Nebraska. One thing that I found really interesting in looking at this list was that four of the top 10 exhibits were local wildlife rather than the more exotic exhibits. You know, in Oakland, it was animals in Oakland. In Oklahoma City, it was animals you can find in Oklahoma. I I thought that was very interesting. And that leaves us with two categories left, aquariums and zoos, and we're going to go in that order. And I I feel the need to justify myself slightly before we move on. Uh, I know I'm dropping friend of the pod in here as different facilities that have been on the pod are are mentioned. Um, And I promise it's not like meant to be a brag or a flex or anything weird like that. I'm just so genuinely blown away by the fact that um, these amazing facilities are on my podcast and get to be a part of this. And it's, it's just so cool. So uh, please, whenever I say that, don't take that as a brag, but take it with the absolute unbridled joy that, uh, that it is coming with. All right. So your top 10 aquariums for 2023, according to USA Today. At number 10, the Tennessee Aquarium in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Number 9, Newport Aquarium in Newport, Kentucky. Number 8, the Florida Aquarium in Tampa, Florida. Number 7, Mystic Aquarium in Mystic, Connecticut. Number 6, the Texas State Aquarium in Corpus Christi, Texas. Number five, the Audubon Aquarium in New Orleans, Louisiana. Number four, and a big friend of the pod, and I am so proud of them for shooting up this list this year, Adventure Aquarium in Camden, New Jersey. Number three is Ripley's Aquarium of the Smokies in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Number two is Clearwater Marine Aquarium in Clearwater, Florida. And number one is Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium in Springfield, Missouri. This is the second time in a row, at least, because I remember it from last year, that um, (laughs) this aquarium has won. And uh, this is an aquarium that was created by the founder of Bass Pro Shops. And it's it's huge and it's awesome. And they have sea turtles and um, they take care of all kinds of really cool animals and also also have a collection of historic boats used by uh, fishing legends and celebrities such as Jimmy Buffett, Ernest Hemingway, and Zane Gray. Pretty crazy and pretty awesome that they keep winning. Also, I need to get more aquariums on this podcast because, I, I mean, they're awesome. Um, but yeah, and this is this is just another example that while I think this is important and is cool to talk about, you'll notice that the Georgia Aquarium did not make the list. 
you know, the Georgia Aquarium. Easily the best aquarium in the country. The, the one with the whale sharks and the manta rays. and Yeah, but, you know, they knew they didn't need to push for the votes either. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see how these lists uh, play out. And then before we get to the top 10 zoos, I have a little story to tell you. So I mentioned that the Cincinnati member page was, was pushing hard to get the Cincinnati Zoo to the top of the list. Well, they weren't alone. Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo also had a huge push from their membership to try to uh, get them at number one. And I can tell you, USA Today shows the voting results live until the last couple of days. And the Cincinnati Zoo and the Omaha Zoo were constantly trading back and forth. So um, there was some drama and then everybody was told to keep voting but couldn't see the results. So uh, now you can find out the results of the drama that you just found out about. But you probably care because that's how the human mind works. Did they make it to the top two? Who won? Did another zoo beat them? I guess we'll find out. So here are your top 10 zoos according to USA Today voting. And again, a reminder, it is voting-based. San Diego didn't make the list, which is redonkulous. Anyway, at number 10, friend of the pod, Indianapolis Zoo in Indianapolis, Indiana. You know, where we've hung out with some walruses and some dolphins and uh, some primates. It's it's, it's a good place, y'all. I'm proud to see them on the list. Number nine, another friend of the pod, the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium in Powell, Ohio. God, I love the Columbus Zoo. Number eight, and although we haven't had them on yet, I do love this facility, the St. Louis Zoo in St. Louis, Missouri. Number seven, the Audubon Zoo in New Orleans, Louisiana. Number six, Zoo Tampa at Lowry Park in Tampa, Florida. Number five, our friends in Chicago, Brookfield Zoo in technically Brookfield, Illinois, because they're right outside of Chicago. Number four, Cheyenne Mountain Zoo in Colorado Springs, Colorado. All right, we're at the top three. At number three, a friend of the pod, Brevard Zoo in Melbourne, Florida. Again, that's a place that you can kayak through the zoo. So it looks like the members of the uh, other two facilities I mentioned did their job and got their facilities to the top. So coming in at number two and a big time friend of the pod, the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden in Cincinnati, Ohio. And the number one zoo, according to this poll, in the whole U.S., is Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium in Omaha, Nebraska. And y'all, it really is an incredible facility. I've only been there once, but I have so many distinct memories from the incredible Red Panda exhibit to all of the, oh my goodness, the buildings there are astonishing, including one that had free flying bats. It was amazing. Um, there was just so much good stuff there. The cheetahs, the cheetah breeding and the cheetah area there is, is to die for. It is an incredible zoo. So congratulations to Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo and also to the, um, members of the zoo who pushed so hard to get them to number one. A position that has been held by Cincinnati for a while now because of members and, you know, being a great zoo and... Fiona, right? And to take them down in the year that Fritz has become a thing, that's pretty impressive, y'all. So uh, congratulations to all of the zoos and aquariums and botanical gardens that won placement on any of these lists. Oh, and since uh, Henry Dorley won, they decided to have some fun with it. And they posted something that said, your number one zoo celebrates you this week. And on March 18th, they offered free tote bags to the people that came uh, while supplies lasted, of course. On the 19th, they did a Jurassic Adventure giveaway. On the 20th, coupons were available at the main entrance for a free small popcorn. 
On the 21st, children under 12 were free at the zoo with the purchase of at least one adult admission. On the 22nd, Stingray Beach got a $1 admission. On the 23rd, all gift shop purchases were 10% off. Today, on the 24th, they're having All About Asia Day and doing all kinds of cool stuff around their Asian Highlands exhibit area. And tomorrow, on the 25th, kids under 12 visit for free. So yeah, it's pretty cool that the zoo decided to celebrate the people who got them to number one. Two cool bits of zoo news come to us this week out of the Nashville Zoo. Uh, Phoebe, who is a red ruffed lemur at the zoo, has officially been confirmed to be pregnant. Um, Now, this is an incredibly awesome lemur who was just recently trained for ultrasound, and they were able to confirm the pregnancy completely voluntarily. They've posted videos of this on the Nashville Zoo social media pages, and I just think that is such a great example of how cool training is. Yay, training. And also, they're going to be opening a leopard forest exhibit in 2024. I'm really excited to see this, especially because they have a melanistic Amur leopard named Rosa, who is now already at the zoo and is going to be exhibited in this new exhibit. I exhibit in an exhibit. I nailed that one, y'all. This is why I am a professional podcaster. But anyway, I am just so excited for the Nashville Zoo, which I love so much and and really without which this podcast probably would have never made it. Uh, So yay, Nashville. Congratulations to our friends at Elmwood Park Zoo, which has reopened after having to be closed for a couple months as they worked to get their whole new entrance things set up because they're expanding great. I talked about this on previous Zoo News. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, it's very exciting uh, that they did all of this, uh, but it's even better that they are now officially reopened. And, you know, the fear sometimes when you close a facility down is that people will lose interest. But in fact, just the opposite was true. Their opening day was Saturday, March 18th, and they were packed to the gills. People were excited to be back and to see all of the amazing animals they love there, like Slash the Red Panda. Um, But also, they were treated to some really cool new animals there. Uh, There was already a Munt Jack named Colby Jack that uh, lived at the zoo, but he now has a potential mate named Violet, and they also have new alpacas and new ducks and pheasants and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, So yeah, I'm excited to see Elmwood Park Zoo continue to grow. I love what I've seen of their master plan, and... I cannot wait to get back home to my home zoo, which I have missed for months now. I am so glad it is open and so sad that I'm in Florida for it. But soon, I'm coming for you, Slash. The Toronto Zoo has announced the birth of four endangered Lao banded iguanas. This is the first time that the species has been born at the Toronto Zoo, and uh, wildlife care staff say they're doing very well and are really enjoying taking care of the little lizards. Uh, I do like, actually, that um, after they've had some real success with uh, some of their their more charismatic baby animals getting hashtags, uh, the Toronto Zoo did decide to add hashtag lizard littles to this story. So we'll see if that catches on as much as some of the more charismatic ones do. I I know what my guess is, but I will tell you, they are very, very cute lizards. The Fort Wayne Children's Zoo has announced a new exhibit that will be opening in the summer of 2023. It is called Red Panda Ridge. I need to get to there. Um, It's going to be located in the same area the red pandas used to be in there. And it will be one of the largest red panda habitats in the United States and will help connect guests to red pandas in new and exciting ways. Uh, They also plan on having some more red pandas there than they have had in the past because it's going to be a bigger area and I want to go to there. You know, I've never actually made it to the Fort Wayne Children's Zoo. And I think we need to correct that. I I think we need to correct that this summer when they're opening Red Panda Ridge, which is, oh, sorry, I'm cycling. But yeah, I'm so excited. 
The Brandywine Zoo in Delaware recently announced that their African savanna serval, named Savannah, has passed away. Uh, she was a beloved animal there. You could not help but love this gorgeous cat and uh, was estimated to be between 20 and 23 years old. Uh, she actually got to the zoo way back in 2006 when she was discovered wandering around because she was apparently an escaped ex-pet. So you may remember last week's episode where we talked about stupid people doing stupid pet things and having exotic animals. Well, this is an example of that, but Savannah was able to escape and then end up at a zoo where, where she was incredibly well taken care of. Um, the keeper staff there really loved Savannah. So this is a big loss for them, but, uh, it's awesome to see just how much love this cat was given throughout the years. Thanks to the incredible team at the Brandywine Zoo. And, you know, speaking of the incredible team at the Brandywine Zoo, the Brandywine Zoo's animal care and education staff received the 2021 Outstanding Organization Award from the Delaware Recreation and Parks Society. The award was given mostly because of the incredible work that the zoo team did during the pandemic, uh, especially creating their new strategies to keep staff, animals, and guests safe. Um, and it's really cool also because it focuses on how the education staff had a pivot from in-person learning to virtual programming, which they did an absolutely incredible job with and ended up reaching people in 15 different states. And I know what you may be thinking when you hear this, which is, yay, that's awesome. But talk about old news, the 2021 Outstanding Organization Award. That's weird. It's 2023. But this award was just given in March of 2020. 2023. I don't know why the delay was there. All I know is that it is totally awesome that Brandywine Zoo received this award. And actually, speaking of Friends of the Pods winning awards, um, the Aquarium of Niagara uh, has been nominated as one of the five finalists for the 2023 Athena Organizational Nonprofit Award. This is a um, organization that looks at nonprofits in the Buffalo, New York area, where Aquarium of Niagara is, and uh, picks the ones that are the best. And whether they win or not, just being nominated as one of the top five is just incredible. Uh, so, congrats to Aquarium of Niagara. So last week, I talked about how New England Aquarium uh, was celebrating the birth of some baby weedy sea dragons because they are incredibly hard to breed and it was a big deal and uh, yay. Well, one week later, we're now celebrating baby weedy sea dragons at Birch Aquarium, uh, which is in La Jolla, California. There are more than 70 newborn weedy sea dragons uh, that hatched between the 2nd of February and uh, the early part of March. That's that's how that works. They just hatch over a period of time. Um, so yeah, apparently the science that has been done to help us understand what needs to be done to successfully breed weedy sea dragons. Uh, it works, y'all. And uh, yeah, so now New England Aquarium and Birch Aquarium both have had successes. Yay! And last but not least this week... Mr. Pickles, a 90-year-old tortoise and the oldest animal at the Houston Zoo, just became a father for the first time. So, uh, yeah, 90-year-old dad. Good thing that tortoise babies, also known as tortlets, kind of, <laughs> um, are, you know, a little calmer than human ones. Um, so, yeah, Mr. Pickles, the father... Uh, lives with Mrs. Pickles, now a mother, and they've lived together since 1996. And Mr. and Mrs. Pickles had babies named Dill, Gherkin, and Jalapeno. Uh, the babies are currently behind the scenes, but will eventually live with their folks. So congratulations to the entire Pickles family. Stereotypical animal podcast theme song. Conservation news. 
All right. So um, last week I told you about the Willow Project being uh, allowed by the Biden administration and how bad that was. Well, I'm happy to tell you that this week, Joe Biden and the Biden administration realizing that they would be doing a lot of damage to pristine, beautiful lands and herding animals, all just to hit some arbitrary goals in a kind of shady way, have decided to change that to say, no, of course they haven't. They're politicians. This sucks. That has not changed. And even the public outcry has not managed to, to make them even pretend that they're considering changing anything, which is just so very disappointing. On the other hand, um, it looks like right now the options for the presidency are going to be Joe Biden and that or Donald Trump or Ron DeSantis who do all kinds of horrible stuff for the environment or Joe Exotic who, as I mentioned about 30 times last episode, is is running for the presidency of the United States. Y'all, we are in trouble. But, you know, let's move on to – other things. I can't say happier because we're in conservation news and it's generally wall-to-wall shit, let's be honest. The National Marine Fisheries Service, which is the federal agency tasked with protecting marine life, has announced that um, it is proposing to list the Sunflower Sea Star as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, This is just another really important, really awesome predator that uh, is now facing extinction. Um, It's it's just a constant reminder that we are screwing things up. And um, yeah, sorry conservation news took such a turn. It's just that, you know, that happens a lot because we're screwing things up. I promise we'll bounce back from this. I promise we will bounce back from this. A 40-ton fin whale was recently spotted swimming off the coast of Valencia in Spain, uh, looking a little bit weird. And it turns out that this whale apparently has a very, very dramatic case of scoliosis. Scoliosis is a disease. You can have it in humans and all kinds of stuff that um, basically just means there's a deformity to the spine and it, it, it adds curvature to the spine. So in a whale, which is kind of a straight, long animal, it's, it's now a curved animal, which also makes it harder for the whale to swim properly. Now, this is not the first time that a whale has been seen with scoliosis, but it is one of the most pronounced cases of it. And um, there is definitely a concern that uh, this might be something that we start to see more um, because they don't know how the whale got so deformed. There's there's no way to tell. Um, but they do believe that it is possible that it was because of an encounter with a powerful ocean vessel because global shipping traffic is on the rise. Uh, this would be the same issue that causes around 20,000 whales to die every year just by colliding with the vessels. Um, and so it's possible that some of these collisions will cause scoliosis or, or even broken backs. So, yeah, again, humans in wild places damaging animals. Yeah, conservation news was not my favorite part of this week's episode. But uh, here's a parody song. It's time for other news. It's time for other news. Hey, no, right now, then now it's time. It's time for other news. Hey, it's a segue to the park on other news. New studies have been released that show that humans love dogs more than other humans even. To this I say, duh. We have talked on this podcast before about the cocaine hippos in um, Colombia, right? So uh, this is not Cocaine Bear the movie. This is not Cocaine Cat who is now doing well at the Cincinnati Zoo. But these are the original cocaine animals, the cocaine hippos, um, which are not hippos on cocaine, which might be the most terrifying thing I've ever even kind of thought of and also might make for a great sequel to Cocaine Bear. Uh, But anyway, 
Um, Pablo Escobar, who was a huge drug pusher out of Colombia and was wildly rich, uh, had all kinds of exotic animals brought to his hacienda. And when he was taken out, um, most of them were rehomed, but they didn't know what to do with the hippos because they, they really didn't have the ability to ship them anywhere. So they just set them free. And then there were hippos running around Medellin, Colombia, and then um, they all started mating with each other and then having babies that mated with each other. And um, now there are lots of hippopotamus running around in Colombia. Just one of the craziest things out there. Over the years, the government has tried multiple things. They have tried to find a way to go out into the wild and to spay and neuter the hippos. Um, one of the most deadly animals in the world. And keep in mind, these are wild hippos. They have no training. Uh, they also just tried culling some of the animals in 2009, i.e. killing them, but they had to stop after a graphic photo caused national outrage uh, in, in the country and around the world. So they are still working on the sterilization program, but it is very hard and um actually the hippos are breeding faster than they are able to sterilize so um the government now wants to try a new strategy uh even though they couldn't ship the hippos back in the 90s when this all went down they now believe that they should be able to safely and effectively ship the hippos. So uh, they are currently negotiating with a park in India where it plans to send 60 hippos and a sanctuary in Mexico where it wants to ship 10 hippos. So that would be getting rid of 70 hippos from Colombia, but also sending 60 hippos into India and 10 into Mexico. I don't, I don't know if that's the best idea. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely interesting to see that they are still trying to deal with this and, and figure this out. An Aldabra tortoise was recently found in Tanzania. And um, from the looks of it, this isn't a pet that escaped. This appears to be an Aldabra tortoise that floated at least 460 miles to get to the coast of Tanzania. Uh, the tortoise you can find photos online, and there are these white things all over it, and those are barnacles, some of which are big enough to show that the tortoise had been in the water for well over a month. And this is not just something that you can find on, like, social media, but this has actually been researched and published. This is ridiculous. So, um, yeah, apparently that's a thing that can happen, and happened. And speaking of studies, um, there's a new study that shows that bumblebees, which we already know are not only really important pollinators, but just kind of cool, fascinating animals, are actually able to not only problem solve, but can then teach other bumblebees the solutions to the problems that they find and the other bumblebees learn from them and pick up on them and are able to then solve those problems themselves. So um, bumblebees are awesome and you should not be afraid of them if you are. You should be afraid of the fact that Joe Exotic is running for president in 2024. I know, I gotta let this drop. Two weeks of this is more than enough. Okay, 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 we're moving on. Animal, animal, animal holidays. Animal, animal, animal holidays. Okay, so it is still March, which means it is my birth month. March 31st is coming up. Get your presents ready. Uh, and then it's also Dolphin Awareness Month, slightly less important, whatever. And then moving on to individual days. So today is the 24th, and we've got nothing. But then on the 25th, it is National Peacock Day, Stork Day, and the day that we celebrate Earth Hour. The 26th is Cory Bustard Day and also launches Lobo Week, which runs from the 26th to April 1st. And then on the 29th, it is Manatee Appreciation Day. And I got to tell you, especially after meeting Hugh and Buffett at Moat Marine Lab, I really appreciate manatees. And those are your animal holidays for the week.
All right. So there you have it, folks. Another episode of Rasafari Zoo News is in the books. I would like to say thanks to my Red Panda level patrons, Laura Shank and Kristen Dickey, and remind you all that you can support the pod for as little as $3 a month by going to patreon.com slash Rasafari. I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who contributed to the episode this week. Uh, those names are Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley, Carrie Kirkpatrick, Kevin Williams, Autumn Lindy, and Chris Dreyer. Thank you all so much for your contributions. Uh, we will be back here on Tuesday with our second episode from the Lehigh Valley Zoo featuring one of the coolest animals I've ever had on my podcast. And remember, friends, the words Newsy Credits Backwards are Steiderk Yeswen. The Rossafari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.